From Southern California, welcome to the Hour of Power. This week, daughters of legendary artist Pat Boone, Lindy Boone, and Debbie Boone, the Hour of Power Choir, and Pastor Bobby Schuler with his message, More Than Conquerors. Discover the face and voice of positive Christianity to the world. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. It's a good day to be at church. Amen? Amen? If you believe it, turn around to those who are standing next to you. Greet them warmly in the name of the Lord. Handshakes and hugs. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Yes, Lord, we love you and we're so grateful that you have invited us here, that everyone who is here is here for a reason. Lord, we, we decide in faith today that we will be open to what you bring us. It doesn't matter if uh, you were dragged here by your dad, those of you listening to this prayer, or by your girlfriend, uh, you're here for a reason. And so, Lord, we receive that today. I pray that the music, the message, the fellowship would draw us closer to Christ. Yes, Lord, we love that. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message today, please hear these words from the book of Romans. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord.
Today it is my joy to welcome Lindy Boone, the daughter of the legendary Pat Boone, who was just here a month ago. She is also the sister of our soloist today, uh, Debbie Boone. So uh, we have a nice uh, a family. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Lindy has a powerful testimony to share. On June 19th, 2001, Lindy's uh, oldest son, Ryan, stepped through a skylight on the roof of his apartment building and fell several stories to a concrete floor. His head injuries were massive, and today Ryan is still at home recovering from that traumatic injury to his brain. In 2013, the Boone family started a foundation called Ryan's Reach, which helps and provides valuable information and resources to other survivors of traumatic uh, brain injuries. Would you please welcome with me Lindy Boone. I mean, I you want to begin with your son, Ryan. I mean, it's tough with kids, you know? Yeah. What was that like, and what happened to your son? Well, I was on vacation in Spain with my husband and my younger son, Tyler, and I got a phone call in the wee hours of the morning, 5 a.m., and I was bouncing off the walls trying to figure out where the phone was because I was in a place I wasn't used to being in. And I heard my sister Debbie's voice, and it was somber, and I knew I better brace myself. And she let me know that Ryan had had an accident. He was 24 years old, living on his own, just out of college, engaged to be married. And he had stepped on a skylight on the roof of his apartment building. The skylight broke, and he just disappeared through it and fell three stories. And all she knew at that time was that he was in the hospital at UCLA, that his skull was fractured, and that his spleen had had to be removed because it burst on impact. So the, I was on the other side of the planet, and that was a hard thing to hear. I can't imagine, Art. How did you, I mean, how do you deal with something like that? How do you? You're never prepared for anything like that, but in, in one important way, I was prepared because I, I knew that I couldn't touch Ryan quickly physically but I was aware that we could join hands in prayer and touch him spiritually yeah. through God, who was with Ryan. Yeah. And I was never so grateful for the gift of prayer at that time to be able to hold my son up to him who could touch him immediately. 
It's amazing he survived. It sounds like he's still kind of recovering and, and... It's a slow process. Brain injury has been something I never wanted to know about, and now I've been living with brain injury and learning about it for 13 years. It's yeah. been 13 years now. Well, and, and in a way, that is one silver lining to this, is that your family has been sort of launched with this foundation. Right. After the initial crisis, and we went through, you know, a long, hard, hard year with Ryan in, in six facilities over 10 months, and then finally moved home, still unable to talk, unable to eat, very fragile. But over time, um, we've been so grateful that God has provided finances for Ryan's care. Yeah. We have caregivers for Ryan. Um, and he's continued to recover. And so when the doctor said, don't get your hopes up, um, people in Ryan's condition don't usually make it. So that was what was told to us. So we are grateful for every day he's on this planet. And he keeps on recovering, and he's a miracle in progress. Yeah. There's a lot of joy, and out of that gratitude, we started a foundation in his name called Ryan's Reach. And with the funds that we raised, because of my dad's celebrity and because this, this accident had a lot of attention on Larry King Live, um, there's been an outpouring of love and prayer for Ryan. And out of gratitude, we wanted to help other people that have... Um, gone through the same kind of thing, but maybe they don't have the platform that we have. Yeah. So we provide scholarships for people with brain injury to attend High Hopes Head Injury Program Great. in Tustin. Oh, that's wonderful. And people, of course, can donate to that, um, I'm sure, online and find you. Google you can go to ryansreach.com and, and see what we're doing because we have a new mission of wanting to start a group home for TBI survivors. Great, great. And then, of course, you started a, a, you wrote a book called Heaven's... Heaven Hears. Heaven Hears. Yeah, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your book. Well, I journaled, which I'm not really a journaler. It's never been my thing. But during the time of the first year and a half, that was the only way I could uh, get my emotions out on paper and feel uh, like I was touching God through my journal. And um, eventually I, I looked at my journal and I put down the lessons that I think God was uh, teaching me in that very tough school yeah. Um, during this time, and uh, I wanted to share it because so many people emailed, prayed, and had seen the programs that we were on talking about Ryan, and yet 10 years had gone by, and they didn't realize that Ryan talks now, eats now, he's learning to walk, he's joyful. Yeah. There's so much um, yeah. to report yeah. that's good. Yeah, that is good. And we, we celebrate with you with that as well, too. And of course, you know, there's so many moms and dads you know, listening on television, many here who don't know what to do in a traumatic kind of scenario like this. I mean, we, Hannah and I have even had something, I mean, not a brain injury, but, you know, what happens when, what advice can you give to parents who have these kind of traumatic events with their children? What do you do? Well, I wrote the book so that I could try to go through the, the journey that I went through, and it'll be different for everybody, but uh, the main thing that I think I did right was I asked God to teach me yeah. in the middle of it. Yeah. I knew and I prayed that this pain wouldn't be for no reason. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in the middle of it, if you press in, you turn your face toward God, not away from God. There's going to be lessons along the way and growth that you won't ever be able to achieve when things are going well. Yeah. You're, you're very ripe to hear from God when you're in the middle of a crisis. And so I would say that my relationship with God has deepened yeah. because of what we've been through. And yeah. um, so I would say press in, turn your face toward God, and praise him yeah. in the dark times. Yeah, I know in, in our suffering, we just wouldn't know what we would do without our faith. And, and you do see that when people go through suffering, whether it's their, their suffering or even worse, the suffering of a child, yeah. some, somehow there's a, the person in the midst of the suffering acquires a tremendous, I think, depth, or can acquire a tremendous it depth can. if it doesn't break them in a way. Right. Can we pray for your son? Please. I think that would be great. And, and, okay. and pray for everyone, too. Who's, and so we'll join together as a church and for those watching on television, for Ryan and for all of those like Ryan uh, and for parents uh, like you. Right. So Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus with faith. And we lift up Ryan. And we thank you that at his young age, uh, he has the possibility to recover. We believe in possibilities. We believe in Ryan. We believe in you. And we believe you can help him be healed. And so we are praying 
um, thousands, millions of hearts around the world now aligned together to pray for Ryan that he would be healed. And I pray, God, that someday Lindy could return here and give us another report of how great Ryan is doing. We pray for her uh, foundation, for Ryan's reach. We pray that it would be blessed, that it would have lots of funding. It would uh, help other children, uh, and men and women like, uh, like Ryan, uh, recover. Lord, thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank we'll keep you. praying for you. And I can just tell, you know, like there's some stories you hear and you feel it, you're still 10 years later kind of working through it yourself. So Absolutely, day at a time. <laughs> we're with you, Lindy. Lindy, thank you for being with us today. And, and your thank testimony you. is not only you know, helping me personally, but it's also going to help uh, many others. And so we're, we're so grateful for you. Thank, thank, you. thank you for coming. All the best. Debbie Boone, hi. Hello. So nice to finally meet you. Ah, so nice to meet you. You know, one thing I didn't say, Lindy, is, you know, I got to meet your dad for the first time a few weeks ago, and he's seriously probably the coolest guy I've ever <laughs> met. You know, even he's at his age, great. he is like, I was sitting there, like, getting makeup, and he came up. I've never met Pat Boone in my life. I'm getting makeup, and he comes up and starts giving me a shoulder massage. And said, <laughs> and he's like, hi, Bobby, how you doing? <laughs> Very, very cool guy. He's so cool. Uh, I just wanted to just catch up with you real quick. Since you're here, um, you know, your faith is important to you, isn't it? Very, very important. And, and, and you're a musician, a very successful musician. How do you, uh, we ask this a lot, especially being in L.A., we have a lot of, you know, young, aspiring musicians, actors. How do you reconcile your faith with some of the pressures of the industry? You know, everybody has pressure in their lives. Yeah. And uh, uh, the pressure in the industry is a different kind of pressure, maybe. Yeah. But, you know, we all deal with, uh, are we enough? Yeah. Uh, that's a big one. Yeah. Rejection in the entertainment industry. And I think that has been the, the deepest gift for me, being in entertainment, is that my identity is not in uh, whether I'm accepted for a job or whether I have a hit record or a television show. My identity is that I am beloved of God, and oh. that never changes. You know what's so weird? You did not know this, but what you just said is the thesis for my sermon today. Precisely. <laughs> not even, not even, like, seriously. It is... <laughs> Today I am I am uh, I am ta I am talking about Henry now and, and that your identity has to be the beloved of God. That is amazing. Love I love Henry now and I love yeah, Henry wonderful. now. <laughs> well, Debbie, great. And and of course that has to be hard being a, a boon, you know, like a pretty <laughs> well-known family, well well-known dad that to not let your identity get wrapped up in right. that, right? It, it that is a challenge. Yeah. Um, but I think that is a, the challenge for every human being is to find out why you are here and who you are, and there's no one like you. Yeah. Well, we're so glad that you're here and your sister is here. It's a blessing thank for us to for have you. Thank you for having us. What oh, a joy. Thank you. That him alone was everything today. Yeah, great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Debbie Boone. Thank you. I'm 
Debbie, thank you. It was, I, I felt a chill really go up my spine, Debbie, when you said, uh, uh, I have to find my identity in being the beloved, because I have pretty much that one thing written over and over in my brief notes. Uh, if you hear anything I say today, hear these words from Henry Nowen. You're not what you do. You're not what you have. You're not what people say about you. You are the beloved sons and daughters of God. If you can really believe that both there is a God, he's a good God, he's involved in your life, he's more interested in your matters than you are, and actually loves you regardless of what you do, have, or what people say about you. If you can believe that, you will be saved. In fact, I think that the, the encompassing message of Romans is that it is not what we do, but that it is what God does that saves us. And he does it because he loves us. That if you read Romans from beginning to end, you ought to leave with a sense of deep, abiding freedom that there is nothing I can do to lose God's immense, tremendous love. Regardless of what society says about you, regardless of what religion says about you, and indeed, regardless of circumstance, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Yet if, if you could wake up every morning and say to yourself, and really pray this, and believe it, that it would go from here to here, I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what people say about me. I'm the beloved. Uh, out of that would spring holiness and life and purpose and calling. Uh, you'd be a new creation. You'd be saved. And really, this is something that isn't believed or not believed. It seems like something that's believed in, in degrees, isn't it? You sort of believe it. You mostly believe it. If only we could believe it in its entirety, we would be totally different. And the more we can believe it, the better. Amen? Amen. So I, this is my message to you today, and it's, and it's what we read from, from the book of Romans, in which Paul says we're adopted. And we evaluated what adoption looks like in the Roman Empire. It's when a, a child goes from being property of of one parent to literally property of another, regardless of age. Even if you're a 55-year-old man and you have a dad that is still living, that dad owns you in the Roman Empire. And last week we evaluated that Paul is saying this is what happens in Christ Jesus, that you move from being uh, slaves to the father of darkness to children of the father of light. That because of Christ, you were bought with a price and now are the beloved treasure of God. Paul then carries on and says, what else does, in my own words, what else would God have to do to prove to you that he loves you than to give his own begotten son, Jesus, for you? God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. If he loved you even a little less than he loves Jesus, he wouldn't have allowed Jesus to die for you, even though he loves you very much. But because he loves you just as much as he loves Jesus, and because Jesus loved, loves you more than himself, I should say the Father, because Jesus is God, uh, then you can say, with scriptural, biblical confidence and authority, you are loved as much as Jesus, as much as Mary, as much as that saintly neighbor that lives across the street that makes lemonade for everybody. God, in your wretchedness and all the things you got wrong in your life and all the ways you messed up and all the ways you're not good enough and all the things you want to do and never accomplish them, God loves you as much as he loves them and as much as he loves Jesus. That, that has to become your identity. I am the beloved, you are the beloved. That cannot be taken from you. Even you can't take it from you. Even if you don't believe you are the beloved, you are still the beloved. Isn't that good news? Your believing in it doesn't make it true or not true. 
It remains true regardless. If you are in Christ Jesus, you have a fantastic future. And so Paul sort of commences this thought with Romans chapter 8, which Chad read today splendidly, I might say. (laughs) Paul says, it's almost like a song, you know. I think there are songs written on this passage. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors. And before I keep going, most people, when they read more than conquerors, that they read this as like, pick, your up by, pick yourself up by the bootstraps, try harder, do your best, fulfill your dreams. Those are good things to do. That's not what this text is saying. This text is saying you are more than conquerors not because of what you do. You are more than conquerors because of what God does. You are more than conquerors because God is actively loving you right now. Okay, I needed to say that. Now, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is the belief in this love that makes us more than conquerors. And Paul is speaking to very specific things, life and death. You know, when you die, you still will not be separated from God's love. Many people are afraid of death. All of us are aging, whether we're young or old. All of us will die. And when that time comes, you will wake up into, not fall asleep, but wake up into the eternal love and life of Christ. Uh, Dying is much more like waking up than falling asleep. Uh, Dying is the time in which you totally receive your full inheritance in Christ Jesus. Uh, No matter how you die, and no matter what condition you're in, and no matter how sinful you are when you die, if you are in Christ Jesus, he will rescue you. That's good news. You can't save yourself. He's gonna save you. No matter how bad you messed up, he's going to save you. He says angels and demons can't separate us from the love of God. What's so astonishing about that is not the demons part, but the angels part. Why did Paul say angels? Um, This is a very superstitious time. A lot of the Jews at this time, according to Barclay, believed that, and this is not true, okay, but they believed that there were three levels for angels. The first level was the seraphim and cherubim in their view. The second level was something called principalities of the air. And the third level was the archangels. And in this sort of legendary mythic view of angels, this third level of archangels was, were mad at humanity because God gave Torah to humanity and they were jealous. And so they had the superstitious view that not only demons but angels were sort of out to get them. Sort of they were like sneaky. Uh, Paul says no, no. Do you ever, maybe not angels and demons, but do you ever feel that way, that there are spiritual principalities working against you? I do right now. I totally do. All this stuff with Cohen and stuff with Hannah and my grandmother's death, that all happened the week after I was called to be the pastor here. Certainly looks spiritual. Certainly hard to believe it's a coincidence. That sort of thing does happen spiritually. But Paul says to us who feel like we're under spiritual attack, you know what? Even though that stuff happens, it's temporary, God's going to win in the end because he loves you. You will have the victory. He says that the present and the future, both the present and the future, cannot separate you from the love, the favor, and the victory of God. That's just good news. How many of you remember the craziness of (laughs) Y2K? (laughs) Man, if you went to a dispensational church during that time, I feel bad for you. Uh, There are a lot of churches that were striking fear in their hearts of the congregation that, you know, the end of the world, that, you know, Christ is going to return and you you better be ready because at 2000, you know, the Bible, you know, there's this, you can read Revelation, you know, if you get it under the right light and, you know, kind (laughs) of just move a couple things around, you know, you'll be able to really see that in 2000, you know, it's all over. And I, I was really blessed to be under the, the leadership of Willie George, who said, you know, Christ is going to return, 
but when he returns, nobody's going to expect it. <laughs> he said the one time Christ is going to return is when everybody stops talking about it. Like every generation, by the way, for all of you who think Christ is returning any day, and, and he might, and I hope he does, come Lord Jesus. But uh, for those of you who, who are really wrapped up in end day stuff, every generation has volumes and volumes of books and newspapers and articles about why Christ is coming back any minute. Maybe you're the right one. I don't know. I doubt that very much. <laughs> but I hope you are. But my, my point is this. I remember during that Y2K, the year 99, not just in the church, but all around the world, there was a lot of fear. There was this thing like, well, all the computers are going to fall, you know, cr- collapse and like planes are going to fall out of the sky and somehow buildings are going to spontaneously crumble and and you know what happened nothing (laughs) you know nothing (laughs) or maybe something maybe some people made some mistakes at that last hour December 31st 1999 they were partying like it's 1999 and they shouldn't have Any Prince fans? I guess not. There are certain jokes where only the choir laughs. laughs. See all the musicians. All right. You know, don't worry about the future. Don't worry about the present. Nothing that you are afraid of in the future. You know, let me just, I'm going to cue you in. Bad things are in your future. Bad things are in my future. It's going to happen. But God will always have the victory. You will never be separated from his love. Nothing can separate you from his love in the midst of those things. Don't worry. When he says height and depth, you know what that means? He's using astrological terms. He's referring to the stars. The specific words he's using would have been very known to the reader in Greek. It's the idea that the star, you know, when the stars go high and when the stars go low. People in this day were, were, were under the tyranny of destiny, the tyranny of the stars. This uh, sort of reigning, pervading thought was that everyone sort of had a destiny, they were born under a particular star, and there was nothing that, that they could do to alternate some tragic course that, that was set before them. And so when bad things would happen, they would think, of course, this is because I was born under the wrong star. And of course, as they studied the sky, when certain stars, your star, went higher into the sky, that meant that oftentimes bad things were going to happen. For some people, it meant good things were going to happen. And that when it went low, well, then now it's sort of, its power is sort of diminished over me, this sort of magic, magical, folk magic worldview. You ever feel that way? You ever feel unlucky? Any people feel like I'm super unlucky? You know what? Be free from that. Be free from that spiritual lie. Have faith in a God who loves you. You are not unlucky. You are blessed. Because you have the God of the universe calling you his favorite. Can I get an amen? Amen. So the message of this is do not worry. Smile. Enjoy your life. Because God loves you. If you can live from a place of that love, if you can live from a place of that love, you can just, you know, people can say stuff about you and think stuff about you, and they will, and you just shrug it off, man. Just be happy and and don't worry because God loves you. And craft your life in response to that love. Now, don't worry doesn't mean just go do whatever you want and be like a horrible person, (laughs) right? No. So these thoughts. You are not what you do. You are not what you have. You are not what people say about you. I think it's really hard for people not to believe they're not what they do. You go to a party, a mixer. Everybody's drinking Martinelli's. And uh, you... uh, (laughs) You meet someone and... Hi, I'm Bobby. Hi, I'm Joe. What's the next question that comes in that conversation if you've never met? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do is a way I can evaluate who you are. I need to establish an identity with the person I've just met, and the way I'm going to do that is by beginning with what they do. Uh, That's very unhealthy. 
I mean, it's nice to know what somebody does for a living, but the, even the way it's said, not what do you do for a living necessarily, or what kind of work do you do? It's what do you do in the sense of like, what you do defines who you are. It doesn't. This is really a big danger. Most of us find an identity in what we do. You know, if you're a mom, it is really hard for moms. Right, Hannah? <laughs> I mean, it's hard for moms not to find an identity. What you do, your whole life is wrapped up in it. What happens when your kids grow up and you're an empty nester? What happens to your identity now? I mean, you're still a mother, but you're not doing what mothers do. What happens if you're a business owner and you lose your business? Your identity was totally wrapped up in that. What happens if you're an athlete and you have these big dreams and you get some major injury? That's what you did. That was your identity. This can even be true for those of us who are religious. What happens if everybody views you as a saint and in your humanness you make a mistake and no longer people believe you as the saintly person, the spiritual leader? Even then, even in your godliness, you're not what you do. You're the beloved. No one can take that from me. In fact, I, would, I wrestle with this, and we all do, and, and one of, I hate getting the question, what do you do? Because I always have to say I'm a pastor. And you might think that's cool. It's not cool when you're like doing something particularly that's fun. Because pastors, in the, most people's view, aren't allowed to do anything that's fun. We have to just like be fasting and praying and like in a library, <laughs> you know, under candlelight. And uh, I, I want Back before I had kids, when I had a life, I uh, used to go to this. Uh, I used to go to this uh, place called the the Gypsy Den in Santa Ana. Uh, oftentimes on, on on Thursday nights, when they had like a open mic night, and you get to like see all these uh, drunk idiots get up with a guitar and like try and play a song, and then they fall over, and everyone laughs, and it's like you're in some like 15th century you know pub in a forest somewhere, and just like with a bunch of pirates, it's awesome. And that's the experience that I got on those Thursday nights. And so the most peculiar, bizarre people would arrive to this, uh, this uh, coffee shop. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I would love to sit outside. For those of you watching in the Netherlands, coffee shop here doesn't mean the place you go to smoke weed. I said that once. <laughs> coffee shop in the Netherlands is where you buy your legal marijuana in the Netherlands. And I was giving a sermon about I'm sitting in a coffee shop reading a book and everybody's like, that's not what I mean. A cafe. <laughs> cafe. And yes, some people were smoking weed, but I wasn't. So anyway. No, just kidding. What was, where was I? <laughs> I'm sitting in this cafe outside, uh, and I loved to just set up a chessboard and, uh, and play chess with random people. And, uh, and people, it's in the chess world, that's something you do. You see a, a chessboard with someone sitting at it, you are welcome to sit at that chessboard and play that person. Uh, any chess players here? Yeah, you were cool like I was in high school, right? Playing chess? Yeah, super cool. <laughs> of all people, a yogi uh, comes and sits to play chess with me. He was this guy in his late 20s with like baggy pants. He was a yoga instructor and like believed in all of this new age stuff, you know, like very esoteric. And uh, he was some kind of a mix of Persian, this and that. And uh, and he was the most bizarre person ever. He was probably that guy, you know that guy that like, you know, checks, he's covered in tattoos, he's like the checkout guy at the Whole Foods with his, you know, master's degree in gender studies and like, you know, <laughs> he's like the guy that like, you know, is handing out things, you know, for Greenpeace. He's like that guy, right? And we're, we're playing chess back and forth and he's using all sorts of colorful language and he's talking about how great socialism is and, uh, and like how great yoga is. And like, there, there really couldn't be two people in the world that are more different than me and this guy. But the really big problem was I really liked this guy. <laughs> in his weirdness, I was like, this is a really cool guy. I want to keep playing chess with him. He was just so interesting and fun. I just fell in love with this guy. And so we're there for a couple hours playing chess and we're like new best friends, right? Uh, you know, and, and, and then he goes, so anyway, what do you do for a living? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I really did not want to say I'm a pastor. And I, I'm like, how can I get out of this? Well, I just told him, you know. <laughs> I 
Well, I'm a pastor. <laughs> you know, and it was hard to say, but, but in the end, because I didn't lie or skirt around it or, or hide the fact that I was a pastor and just kind of talk about it, because I was so interested in myself, I almost missed out on what, what, what ended up being a great opportunity. That guy changed his view of what he thought about Christians and pastors because he played chess with me. But if I, if I had been like, you know, too afraid, too self-absorbed in my own identity as, as, you know, too afraid of losing this sort of new friendship with this person, uh, well, he would have really missed out on something special. And he came to the church a couple times. He, you know, he's not going to go to, a guy like that's not going to go to church. Just kidding. No. <laughs> Just go to Tree of Life. There's tons of people like that at that church. But uh, <laughs> no, he, he, uh, he, um, no, he came to church a few times and was a, a wonderful person, and, and, uh, and, and it was a good, good thing. So I, it is so important to just know, whether you're a pastor or, or whether you're a yoga instructor, whatever it is you do, that, that no matter what you do in life, whether it be morality, whether it be vocational, whether it be goals and anything, whatever it is, you're not what you do. You are not what you do. You're also not what you have. Uh, it is also very easy to find your identity in the stuff you have, your car, your clothes, the kind of house you live in. Some of you find your identity in what you don't have. Uh, some of you are proud of what you have. Some of you are proud of what you don't have. Well, that's unhealthy too. Just don't worry about what you have. It doesn't define you. If I, if I were describing to you a, a person, he's big, he's got a beard, he's got a black helmet on, a black jacket, black pants, boots. And what, who am I describing? John Fry. John Fry? <laughs> That's a biker. Or John Fry. Uh, if I describe a, a, a teenage girl in a, in a, in a skirt and, a, and like a colorful tank top with pom-poms and her, her hair is a cheerleader, right? Like the, the way that you think about clothing and cars, you know, forms the, the way you identify someone as an individual. Well, we re reflect this back on ourselves. Uh, you know, if you're really concerned you're not dressed a certain way when you go somewhere, you are identifying yourself by what you have. If you think, if, if I lost everything today, I wouldn't have certain friends and that scares me, then you are identifying yourself as what you have. And, and join the club, by the way, because we all do it. And we're usually unaware of it. And it's not, like you, you, it's not like just rich people do this. Everybody does this. Even poor people do this. There are poor people that are afraid of getting rich because they won't have their poor friends anymore. Um, I have seen it in every level, economics, everywhere. People do this. You're not what you have. You're the beloved. No one can take that from you. You're not what you, you do and you're not what you have. And most importantly, and this is the biggest one of them all, you are not what people say about you. And don't believe it. Unless it's what I'm saying right now, which is that you're the beloved. <laughs> you know, there's something about words that are so life-giving or so heart-rending. Man, words are, can be so healing and so violent. And especially if you love someone and they, they say something about you that is so hard not to take that thing they say about you as part of your identity. I had an autistic kid yesterday tell me I have yellow teeth. <laughs> that doesn't, please don't take that seriously. I was actually sitting with Hannah. We were sitting under a tree and this kid sits next to me. It's like 10. And he goes, you ever try and find your car and you can't find it? I have no introduction, right? I'm like, yeah, all the time. He goes, me too. <laughs> He's 10. <laughs> he goes, but it's also the other way. Sometimes when you're driving your car, you can't find a parking spot. And I look at him and I say, I know. Happens to me all the time. And he looks up at me like this. He goes, your teeth are yellow, especially the pointy ones. And then he gets up and walks away. <laughs> I 
So uh, there is something about what people say about you that you, it's, it's hard, especially if it's bad stuff, not to pay attention to it. And it's so easy to forget the good stuff, isn't it? So easy. Man, if, if, if 100 people say a good thing about my sermon and one person says a bad thing about my sermon, guess who I remember? <laughs> you don't have to guess, you know. Even as a Schuler. <laughs> you know, and I, I, imagine, and we treasure what people say about us. I mean, how many times have you heard someone, they're like, you should hear what Sarah said about you. Actually, no, you know what? I, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't. <laughs> that person, you know, you're like, come on, what do they say? No, you know what? I promised I wouldn't say anything. You pretty much pay any amount of money. The longer that person holds out on you, they'll change the subject, and you're like, you know what, hold on, hold on. Go back. What did Sarah say about me exactly? And of course, the longer that goes on, the more you're going to listen to what Sarah said about you. And what she said about you, you're going to think about it for several days, maybe weeks, if you're as neurotic as someone like me. <laughs> no, what people say about you doesn't matter. You're the beloved. I was a... When I was uh, about 11, someone in my life I care very much for that loved me very much said something to me once, and, and I remembered it as a funny story. As I shared this thing with my wife, Hannah, as a funny story, and I don't cry very often, I started weeping. Somehow, this funny thing that in my, my conscious mind that I thought was funny, my subconscious mind or my heart took as a wound, and I had never processed it as a child. And I just was telling this funny story and then started weeping as I'm driving the car, crying all the way home, and then got, gained my composure, went into the house, and then started thinking about it, choking up again, went out into the woodshed and cried for another 30 minutes. That is really weird for me. I'm a, I feel like I'm a pretty stable, like not crying kind of guy, and and what was said was not horrible, but for whatever reason, as a child, I must have just taken it so hard that, and it was so cathartic to sort of pray into that and release something that had been swirling around inside of me that I never even knew was there. You know, we can become such slaves to what people think about us. We can become such slaves to circumstance, slaves to the future, slaves to the stars. Slaves to trauma and tragedy. Slaves to image. Slaves to money. Slaves to dress. Slaves to all of these things. Slaves to what we do. But you know what? All of that's going to go away someday. And you know what will be left? Eternal life. God's fullness in life. And you know what? You don't have to wait to die to get that. If you only had faith you could have it right now as you walk out of this church and carry it with you the rest of your life and everything would be different. You're the beloved. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. We don't deserve this kind of love. You are not like us. You do not shift on a whim. You do not disown us. You are not disappointed with us. You do not judge us based on what we do or what we have or what others say about us. The only thing that matters is what you say to us and you say, you are my beloved sons and daughters. I have made covenant with you. I have adopted you. I own you. You're mine and I love you. I will care for you and provide for you the victory and a fantastic future. Lord, we believe it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for being here today and worshiping with us. I just want to remind you that uh, Debbie and Lindy will be outside uh, signing CDs. They'd love to meet you. So go meet a Boone. They're cool. That's a very cool family. I like them. For those of you watching on the Hour of Power, if you need me to pray or our church to pray for you, we pray a lot. Write to us. We'd love to hear about what's happening in your life. We want to hear from you. Tell us what we can do to help you better. Thank you guys for being here. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.